Hi, and welcome to the Chapter 4 Lecture for Microbiology. This chapter is all about eukaryotic cells, following Chapter 3, which is all about prokaryotic cells. So eukaryotic cells are a bit more complex. They have a bit more parts. This chapter is a bit longer. And there's multiple types of eukaryotic organisms that can be pathogens that we'll talk about. So some interesting history about eukaryotes. I don't know where to put my face. We're going to put it here for now. So um, eukaryotes are thought to have evolved. And in fact, I think there's actually significant genetic evolutionary evidence that they did involve, evolve this way through a process known as endosymbiosis, essentially meaning that one cell ate another cell and then that's, that ingested cell just kind of became part of its host cell and they forevermore were coupled together. So imagine an ancient primitive prokaryote that swallows uh, another bacteria and then that bacteria slowly be, just kind of becomes a permanent resident here and some of its genes end up going to the DNA of the, the host cell and so you have these these membrane bound organelles inside of a eukaryotic cell some of which the mitochondria in particular are are resemble very much like a a shriveled up bacterial cell so mitochondria will see have some unique features that basically make them look very much like little bacteria that have somehow become incorporated into into eukaryotic cells um, and then that's how eukaryotic cells evolved. Another endosymbiotic event is thought to have led to the creation of plants, the whole family of plants, because um, plants contain an additional organelle called a chloroplast, which is kind of similar to the mitochondria, except that it can do photosynthesis and generate um, oxygen and glucose from carbon dioxide and energy from the sun. But it's cellularly, the chloroplast is very similar in structure to the mitochondria. It has a double membrane, has little tidbits of DNA left over. So it's kind of cool. Kind of a, it's a super rare event that has happened possibly only twice ever in history of evolution, um, but has led to these new branches of the tree of life. So the, I'll put it right here. Um, the types of organisms, of microorganisms that have eukaryotic cells are the protozoa. These are all single-celled organisms that are small and usually motile, um, and they have lots of different forms of motility. Fungi and algae are also, can be microbes. They can also be macrobes um, and large. So they, can, they have the ability to be unicellular or multicellular. And then the helminths, which are honestly some of my favorite microbes because they are the weirdest. Helminth is the scientific term for a parasite, a parasitic worm, I should say. So um, we're gonna learn all about these after we talk about some basic cell biology. So eukaryotic cells, um, have all of the following parts. So starting like we did last chapter, we're going to go from external structures to internal structures. So eukaryotic cells might have appendages, okay? They might. That's what these um, misplaced um, parentheses are supposed to be around the appendages, okay? So they might have flagella, they might have cilia, they might not have any appendages as all, at all. They pretty much all have a glycocalyx, some kind of carbohydrate coating. Some of them have a cell wall. The parentheses actually belong around here. It's actually much less common for eukaryotes to have a cell wall than for prokaryotes. But, and they must have a cytoplasmic membrane. And then within the cell, where bacteria basically had cytoplasm, DNA, and ribosomes, Eukaryotic cells have a lot more stuff going on. So there's the cytoplasm, the DNA is found in the nucleus, and there's some subnuclear structures we'll talk about. There's multiple different organelles, these membrane-bound structures that have various functions. There's ribosomes and the cytoskeleton proteins. 
So here is an image from the textbook that looks at a, you know, general sample eukaryotic cell, a generic, generic eukaryotic cell. And here's the image of the bacterial cell for comparison. Okay, so much more going on here in the eukaryotic cells. So starting on the outside, bacteria and eukaryotes can both have flagella. They have the same function, but they have different structures. The eukaryotic one is structured a little bit differently, and we'll talk about that. On the outside, eukaryotes can also have a glycocalyx, similar but different to the bacterial cells. They might have a cell wall. They all definitely have a cell membrane. Where is the cell membrane? Here it is. Here's where it's identified in the orange. It's the orange layer there. And then the blue jelly stuff is the cytoplasm. The little purple balls floating around everywhere are ribosomes. Here, this big purple um, open space right here represents the nucleus, and DNA is found within the nucleus. There's this dense area in the center of the nucleus called the nucleolus, and we'll talk about the function of that. Outside of the nucleus, you can see this, the, the nucleus is purple, right? And the membrane of the nucleus is purple, but this purple membrane kind of extends beyond the nucleus in these, these kind of, you know, wavy tunnels. Those wavy tunnels are called the endoplasmic reticulum, or the ER. And you'll notice that the part here um, is covered with little blue balls, those ribosomes, so we call this the rough ER. And then this region over here of the endoplasmic reticulum doesn't have any ribosomes attached to it. It's called the smooth ER. Um, another organelle, important organelle, is the orange one pictured here. It looks like kind of like a bunch of hollow pancakes stacked on top of each other. That's the Golgi apparatus. It's the shipping center of the cell, we'll see. Um, these blue organelles that we can see little cross sections of, they have two membranes are the mitochondria. These are the powerhouses of the cell. They pump out a bunch of ATP. Um, these pink and orange tubules here are cytoskeleton proteins. Um, and this uh, organelle here that looks like it's got a bunch of stacks of green coins in it is a chloroplast. Some eukaryotic cells have a chloroplast, some do not. Um, other ones, this orange Bacule right here is actually a lysosome, so it's a, a vesicle that contains lots of digestive enzymes. Um, those are the main things that I wanted to call attention to. And now we're going to go through each of those parts, of course, in detail. So, starting with external structures, uh, we'll start with the flagella and cilia. So these are structures that are used for moving, for movement, for motility. So flagella, we're uh, well aware of flagella, it's like a tail. In bacteria, prokaryotes, we said that the flagella spins around like a propeller, okay? Not in eukaryotes. In eukaryotes, the flagella waves. It moves sort of back and forth, back and forth. So there's a different mechanism of motion there is a, and that's because of the different structure um, and also the filament itself that makes up the flagella the tail is made of, of a different material so in eukaryotes it's actually very thick and it's made up of an arrangement of proteins called microtubules and the microtubules are arranged in this what's called nine by two microtubule arrangement so there's Basically think of like if I had a bunch of pipe cleaners, two pipe cleaners in the middle and then nine around that wrapped around it. Like I think of almost like a piece of, of like licorice, the kind that you like can peel the strings. All right. So it's just it's 11 tubules packed together in this arrangement. Um, cilia are really just short flagella. They're made of the exact same thing. They're also made of microtubules in a nine plus two arrangement, um, but they are short and numerous in structure. So flagella, um, oftentimes eukaryotes have one or a couple of flagella, uh, longer sort of whip-like um, appendages, whereas cilia are smaller. They, and they're usually more numerous, like covering the whole surface of the organism. And they're like little 
fins that wave and help them move. Some other external structures, the glycocalyx is pretty standard. So again, it's just going to be a surface coating that's made up of polysaccharides. Remember, carbohydrates, polysaccharides can be kind of sticky. Glycocalyx usually is involved in helping things stick or bind. Um, so molecules can bind to it, signal reception. Some eukaryotic cells do have a cell wall. The difference is it's made up of a different material than prokaryotes. So prokaryotes like bacteria have peptidoglycan as the main building material of their cell wall. But um, fungi and algae have chitin or cellulose as their uh, cell wall st structures as the carbohydrates that build their cell wall. So it's different. And you can see here that the cell wall is made of more layers in these creatures. So the types of eukaryotic microorganisms that have a cell wall are generally those that come in the single cell variety, um, fungi and algae. I take it back, protists are all single celled and they do not have cell walls. They just don't. So fungi and algae do have a cell wall sometimes, most of the time. Protists and helminths do not. And animals and stuff do not either. All right, um, the cell membrane, same basic structure as we saw in prokaryotes. It's a phospholipid bilayer with proteins embedded in it. Just some of the phospholipids are a slightly different flavor. Um, and of course, there's also the sterols, like cholesterol, that get embedded in there to modify the fluidity of the cell membrane. So those are the external structures. Now for all of the internal structures. So the first one, the central one that's most important, is the nucleus, which houses the cell's DNA. It's where the DNA gets replicated and where it gets, um, I should say, transcribed, not translated, where it gets transcribed. So here's the nucleus. These little dots looks kind of like a, or like a, like a red moon. Okay, all these dots on the surface look kind of like craters. These are nuclear pores. It's how things can get in and out of the nucleus. Um, this nucleolus here is where our RNA, ribosomal RNAs, are made. Um, and they're pretty important. They basically make ribosomes here. Um, the membrane of the nucleus is called the nuclear envelope. It's a phospholipid membrane. Whenever we're talking about membranes on a cellular level, we're talking about a phospholipid bilayer, whether it's prokaryotes, eukaryotes, organelles, a membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. Um, and then we can also see the DNA very loosely coiled up in here. Um, when DNA is spread out loosely and uncoiled, it's called chromatin versus when it's tightly bound up, we call it chromosomes. Slightly different terminology there. It can be confusing. So here you can see all this like sort of bumpy stuff. This is an EM, an electron micrograph that's been um, colored, like manually colored, um, to show the nucleus. So all of these little bumps here are actually, that's actually DNA just all over the cell. DNA and histones, which are the proteins that DNA wraps itself around. And here, this dense center is the nucleolus where ribosomal RNA is being made. And then you can see that picture of the, of the nucleus. Here's our eukaryotic cell, and there's the nucleus, and we just sort of pull that out of the cell. And you can see that the extension of the nuclear membrane is the endoplasmic reticulum. So that is the next organelle we're going to talk about. The endoplasmic reticulum is just, it's an extension of the nuclear membrane. And um, a lot of it is covered in ribosomes. These little balls here represent ribosomes. We call that part of the endoplasmic reticulum the rough ER. And ribosomes, as we'll see, continue to see, are the protein makers, the protein making machinery. They basically, their job is to pump out proteins. And so it makes sense when we talk about central dogma. Um, the DNA in the nucleus encodes the proteins. The RNA makes a copy of the DNA sequence, and then these little RNAs 
exit the nucleus and then land right in the ER where there's tons of ribosomes to translate them into proteins. So it's just a big protein making factory basically. The smooth ER doesn't make proteins, it makes lipids. And so that's why there's no ribosomes there. Ribosomes have no role in lipid making, they make proteins. So the smooth ER makes lipids. I don't know a good mnemonic for that, but maybe um, R somehow make like a mnemonic for R equaling proteins and S equaling fats. I don't know. So after the proteins are made or the lipids are made in the endoplasmic reticulum, they usually need to be, they need to go somewhere in the cell. They don't, the cell does, you know, the, the ER is not just like randomly spitting out proteins and lipids. Um, just like, you know, a factory is not just, you know, making toys and just kicking them out into the parking lot. They get shipped to stores or they get shipped to people. So if you think of the endoplasmic reticulum as sort of like a factory that's manufacturing products and the cell, the rest of the cell is like a city and there's like lots of different neighborhoods in that city that these different products need to be shipped to. And so you can think of the Golgi apparatus as like the post office um, or the UPS. So all of these these products made by the endoplasmic reticulum, they go, they travel in these vesicles to the Golgi apparatus. In the Golgi apparatus, they basically get packaged and postmarked and then shipped out to other parts of the cell. So when I say they get packaged and postmarked, they, some, the proteins might get glycosylated or they might get snipped or refolded. Um, so there's a lot of maturation of the proteins finishing touches that get put on in the Golgi apparatus. And they do literally get marked with chemical signals that say, I'm going to the membrane, or I'm going to the lysosome, or I'm going to some other part of the cell. So I've already sort of made this analogy, but just to visualize it, you can kind of think of these parts, different parts of the cell as an assembly line in like a manufacturing process. The nucleus is where the instructions are, maybe like the computer programming to make some product. Like I just think of like a toy or something in a factory. And then the rough ER is the factory floor with all of the machines that are actually making these products based on like these toys, based on the instructions from the computer program. And then you take, maybe you like roll all those products out in a cart, you take them to the shipping factory, to the shipping center, the post office where they get packaged up in boxes, maybe wrapped in bubble wrap, and then sent to their final destinations, wherever that may be, might be the cell membrane, might not be. So when we talk about these little shipping containers, we call them vesicles. So a vesicle is any small membrane bound container inside the cell. And um, so things are shipped to from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi in vesicles. Another type of vesicle is called a lysosome. And lysosomes are vesicles that contain digest, excuse me, digestive enzymes. Um, so that, and another type of type of vesicle is a vacuole. So uh, we'll talk about cells being able to eat through a process of endocytosis where they literally just pinch off an area of their surroundings and swallow it. And when they do that, they need to then be able to digest it. Well, cells don't have a stomach. The lysosome is kind of like the cell's stomach. So the lysosome comes and fuses with that food vacuole. The enzymes digest the food inside the vacuole and then the vacuole can dismantle and release those products to the cell or merge with another organelle <clears throat> for storage, etc. So those digested products can be used by the mitochondria to generate energy. So energy, the, ce the cell uses a molecule called ATP for energy. And we met ATP in the first chapter. So um, the mitochondria, we'll see, looks, I said that it, it's the organelle that arose through that first endosymbiotic event, 
where one cell ate another cell. So let's look at some of the things that make it very similar to a prokaryotic cell. So first of all, it has two membranes, right? A prokaryote has one membrane, right? But if it gets swallowed by another cell, then it'll take some of that membrane with it, resulting in two membranes. Um, the mitochondria has its own ribosomes within it and they don't match the ribosomes that are in the cytoplasm of the cell. Remember we said that eukaryotes have an 80S ribosome, it's slightly larger than prokaryotes, but mitochondria within eukaryotic cells have 70S ribosomes. They have prokaryotic ribosomes. They also, mitochondria also contain their own DNA. They contain DNA for genes that are important for the mitochondria to function. So they don't contain enough genes for the mitochondria to live on their own, to sort of survive as its own cell. So the mitochondria must exist inside the cell. It depends on the cell, but it kind of resembles its own thing with its own DNA and its own ribosomes and its own extra cellular membrane. So <clears throat> they're pretty cool that way. Um, and so the idea with the whole endosymbiotic event is that, you know, you had two cells that were each making their own energy. And then one cell swallowed the other cell and that other cell just basically became the energy maker. That became its job. And so the eukaryotic cell had all this time to an energy that it could use to, you know, learn new skills, I suppose. Um, and so that's how eukaryotic cells were able to um, grow and adapt to new things. They had these energy makers within them. So, and some eukaryotic cells have multiple mitochondria, depending on how much energy they need, cells will have different numbers of mitochondria. Oh, another thing about mitochondria is they, they actually divide on their own like so they divide separately from the cell division process so they divide when the cell divides but they can also divide on their own so there's the different parts of the mitochondria let's get to the sort of anatomy here so there's two membranes there's the inner membrane here and there's the outer membrane these folds of the inner membrane are called the cristi and the sort of cytoplasm inside the mitochondria is called the matrix, the mitochondrial matrix. And then between the two membranes is what we call the in intermembrane space. Intermembrane space. So this is just my, so I got a little ahead of myself, but this is my slide talking about how, um, how the, the mitochondria really resembles a bacterium. Um, and is evidence of this endosymbiotic event that occurred. So a bacterium has its own DNA, not in a nucleus, all right? The mitochondria has its own DNA, not in a nucleus. Bacteria reproduce um, independently by fission, um, just by splitting, and mitochondria reproduce the same way. So there's, and they also have those 70S ribosomes the mitochondrial DNA also, I should say, is circular, like a bacterial DNA, whereas eukaryotic DNA in the nucleus is linear. Okay, so all of these little pieces of evidence help to contribute to this endosymbiotic theory that this event occurred millions of years ago that led to the rise of, or the origin of eukaryotic cells. The other organelle that arose from an endosymbiotic event are the chloroplasts. Now chloroplasts are found in photosynthetic algae and photosynthetic bacteria and plants, none of which are human pathogens. So we really won't discuss this one much, but no, when we talked in the first chapter about how something like 70% of the earth's oxygen is produced by microbes, these photosynthetic microbes, algae, and even cyanobacteria are responsible for taking water and carbon dioxide in the environment and converting it into oxygen and sugars that we then consume. Like that's why we, so many organisms consume plants 
because they are the only creatures that can actually make sugar. They make energy molecules that the rest of us consume for energy. So um, <clears throat> other internal structures, of course, all cells, prokaryotes and eukaryotes must have ribosomes. And ribosomes are these protein making machines. Now in prokaryotes, they are just freely scattered throughout the cell. In eukaryotes, they are found throughout the cytoplasm, but they are also found attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And they're also found in the mitochondria and chloroplasts. But remember, those are the 70S variety, the sort of prokaryotic variety that are found in those organelles. Um, and so again, just to highlight the difference, prokaryotes have a 70S ribosome. The eukaryotic ribosomes are 80S. They're very similar, but different enough to make a good drug target. Alrighty, so now for some other structures inside the cell, ske bleh, the cell, the cytoskeleton. We talked about the cytoskeleton proteins of prokaryotes. They help to keep give the cell its shape, just like our bones give our bodies shape and structure and rigidity. Um, the proteins that eukaryotes use for their cytoskeleton are different than the ones that prokaryotes use. There's three, and their three names are actin, microtubules, and intermediate filaments. And they all have slightly different purposes. Um, one is really thick and rigid. Another can disassemble and stretch. Um, so it helps shell cells actually move and change shape. Um, they also act as sort of highways for vesicles to sort of travel on as they go from the Golgi apparatus to different parts of the cell. Uh, and they're important in humans. You learn about them in anatomy physiology when talking about muscles and muscle contraction. Actin binds to um, a protein called myosin, and that's how muscles contract. So cytoskeleton parts are, are still really important. Okay, so now let's talk about the different organisms, microorganisms that are eukaryotic. So the first one are the fungi. And we have macroscopic fungi and microscopic fungi. So you're all probably familiar with macroscopic fungi. Have you had mushrooms on your pizza or you've spotted some in your yard or while out for a hike, okay? These are visible with the naked eye, but they are fungi. Um, they're not the kind that we study in this class, though they can cause illness, some even worse than the, than the microscopic fungi that we talk about, but uh, we won't go there in this class. So the microscopic fungi are ones that are yeast, we, the yeasts and the molds, <clears throat> All right? So fungi are important, and um, you saw this in one of your TED Talks, or it wasn't a TED Talk, but one of the video assignments, the first video assignment, that microbes are really important for decomposition of dead matter. And fungi, along with bacteria, play a really important role in that. And we need matter to decompose so that we can recycle it. Um, fungi are also really important for plants. A lot of plants require their roots um, form these, these associations with fungi. Fungi have this ability, I'll show you in a minute, they, they can digest food externally. So basically like they vomit like acid that digests nutrients in the environment and then they, they suck it up, um, absorb it, but also anything else in the vicinity could absorb those nutrients as well. And so plant roots benefit from that because plant roots, basically fungi make the soil they basically blend the soil into this rich smoothie that the plants can drink up as well. Um, fungi also are great producers of antibiotics. They live in the same communities as bacteria and often compete with them. And in fact, the very first antibiotic that was discovered, which was penicillin, was made and discovered um, by a fungus that was on a cantaloupe in a grocery store. Um, we also use fungi to make alcohol, to ferment fruit and grain, to make beer and wine, and we can use them to make vitamins, a lot of B vitamins. Um, some cons of fungi is they can cause infection. So the medical term for a fungal infection is a mycosis. 
myco means fungus. They can also cause non-infectious diseases, so you can breathe in fungal spores and have an allergic reaction to them. You can't spread that reaction to other people, but it can, so it's not infectious if you can't spread it to other people, but it can cause allergies. Um, and fungi are actually very, uh, they're important for decomposition, but sometimes they are the cause of decomposition that maybe we don't want, like food. So about 40% of produce that's sold, like in grocery stores, actually goes to rot because of fungi. It's fungi that actually start um, the rotting process. <clears throat> well, the plants have enzymes as well that start rotting, but it really gets going when the fungi come into play. Okay. So the fungi that cause human disease are the ones that we'll focus on in the class. Um, some of them are from, you know, just acquired in the environment. Some are hospital associated infections that people get when they are hospitalized. And some are what we call opportunistic infections. So they really only make people sick if they are already immune compromised. And in fact, a lot of fungal infections are really dangerous with pe for people with compromised immune systems um, that, you know, they aren't dangerous if you have a healthy immune system, but the fungi can be a real problem. So our immune system is actually normally pretty good at fighting off fungi. And then if our immune system is compromised, we become very vulnerable to fungal infections. Most common fungal infections are on the surface, our skin, and they're usually pretty mild and and not too serious, but there are some infections of other organs like the lungs and even the brain that can happen. But again, most of these are in people with uh, very reduced immune systems, but there are some that are what we call true pathogens. And the one that we'll talk about this semester more is really coccidioides. <clears throat> so fungi, um, microscopic fungi can grow in two different ways. And most fungi are actually dimorphic, meaning they can grow both ways. So dimorphic, is kind of like the bacterial term pleomorphic. So they have two different forms. So they can grow either as yeasts, where they are round, small round cells, or they can grow as these elongated cells, which are called hyphae. Right, some can only grow as yeast. So Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is baker's yeast, which you use to make bread. All right, it only grows in the yeast form. But some fungi can grow as yeast under one condition, like at 37 degrees Celsius, and can grow as molds, as fuzzy hyphae, at 25 degrees Celsius. So that this is a list down here just showing you some different bacteria that grow at co cooler temperatures, like room temperature, in the mold form, and then at warmer temperatures in a yeast form. And then on this plate here, it's showing you two different types of fungi, one that grows as a yeast at this temperature and one that grows as a mold. So you'll see that yeast colonies look a lot like bacterial colonies. They're small and round, whereas molds that are due to these microscopic hyphae, or feathers almost, they look fuzzy and velvety. And that's usually how we think of mold as looking fuzzy like this. So another name for this fuzzy mold is called a mycelium. The velvety colonies formed by molds are called mycelium. So this is just another picture looking at these hyphae. And so taking one of these fuzzy mycelium and zooming in, and we see all of these hyphae. All right, so there are vegetative hyphae and there are reproductive or fertile hyphae. And the reproductive ones produce spores, the vegetative ones do not. Some microbes or some fungi have um, non-septate hyphae, so they're smooth. Others have septated hyphae, which have divisions, all right, they're called a septum. So there's there's different forms of filamentous fungi. Here's what I was talking about before about fungal nutrition. 
So fungi are heterotrophic, means they can eat lots of things. Um, they can be saprobes, which means they digest dead stuff, or they can be parasites and eat living things. Um, <clears throat> they have this neat method of extracellular digestion where they secrete their digestive enzymes and digest basically outside of their cells and then they absorb the nutrients and other organisms in this vicinity can also absorb those nutrients as well so fungi are like good friends to have in the microbe world because they share their food um so just a quick semantics lesson all right we're talking about fung fungal spores here fungal spores are the reproductive body is sort of like the seeds or eggs, if you will, if we have to have an analogy for these microbes. Different than bacterial endospores. Bacterial endospores are those tough little, you know, seeds that are resistant to tough environmental conditions. Fungal spores are not as hardy um, and they are the reproductive pieces of fungi. And they can spread kind of like you think of seeds, like flower seeds, it can be blown in the wind or carried by animals or float in water um, and germinate like a seed germinates and produce a new, a new fungus. So fungi can reproduce both asexually and sexually. So asexually means they just divide and make clones of themselves. Um, but sexually means that they merge their DNA with another fungus to create genetically unique offspring. And that really enhances genetic diversity. Um, so sexual reproduction is really a strong like mover of evolution and changing genetics of populations. So this is just a picture showing you some of the different methods of reproduction and spore formation in fungi. I'm not asking you, you don't need to learn these different types. I'm not going to get that focused into fungal cell biology, but just to show you some of them form a spore sac that ruptures and releases and others form um, free spores that kind of, you know, shed off as they are mature. And so there's but they all are different ways of producing spores. So those are the fungi. The next type of eukaryotic microbe are the protozoa. And protozoa are really cool looking. They look like alien creatures from another planet and probably were a lot of the animalcules that Leeuwenhoek first described under his microscope. The word protozoa literally means first animals. Um, because they are mostly all motile, they move in some form or fashion, so they do seem very much like little living, like little animals, weird little animals. Um, they do have, spe they have very highly specialized organelles. They have a lot more organelles than other typical eukaryotic cells that are very specialized. Um, a lot of these you can find in like pond water. So if we were to go sample some pond water, which I've done before in live class, you can oftentimes see paramecium's swimming around. And Volvox is another one that you can often spot in, um, in pond water or Euglena even. And they really do look just like this. So they move, they have different methods of movement and they're sort of, categorized by their different methods of movement. So I'll put my face down here for now. Um, the four different classes of parasites, of pro sorry, of protozoa, are the amoeboid protozoa. So these are amoebas, and they move by something called pseudopods. They have these, pseudopod literally means a fake foot. So they, they're basically like little slime molds that crawl through like, you know, like a blob. Um, they extend their little slime feet and and move that way. There are some that are ciliated and they move through cilia. Um, <clears throat> there are some that are flagellated. They have a flagella. 
And then there are ones called apicomplexans, and they move by something called um, rolling motility, gliding motility, gliding motility. So they kind of swim. And all of these have pathogens. There are pathogens in these different classes of protozoa, but that's how protozoans are, are sort of classified by their type of movement. So um, protozoa can be found all kinds of places. They really like moisture. So you find them a lot in like moist soil, in pond water. You don't typically find, I don't think there's many that normally live in the human body. There might be, you know, like a handful. Um, but a lot of times protozoa are either harmless to us or they are pathogens. Um, so they oftentimes have specialized feeding structures. They have specialized organelles. They're just really crazy and cool looking. So this is an amoeba that eats your brain. And this is um, the, the parasite that causes, this is Giardia lamblia, which causes giardiasis, which is like really bad diarrhea. Sometimes it's called beaver fever because people get it if they uh, drink like dirty river water. Um, so most protozoa have a two-stage life cycle where they go through a feeding stage and a cyst stage. So the protozoan cyst is kind of like the bacterial endospore. It's a more resistant, um, dormant phase of the life cycle. When conditions are not good, they can form a cyst. And then when conditions are good, they get reactivated and they enter the feeding stage, the modal feeding stage, which is called the trophozoite stage, the active feeding stage. A lot of times when we get infected, it's because we have consumed the cyst stage and then the trophozoite stage becomes activated inside our bodies. I think this is a picture of a Giardia lamblia cyst rupturing. So here's the trophozoite coming out. Um, protozoans can reproduce asexually and also a lot of them can reduce can reproduce sexually. So asexual reproduction is just division, like binary fission, and sexual reproduction involves the swapping of some DNA between the two, mixing and matching, and that's sexual reproduction. A lot of them have really um, elaborate uh, DNA. Let's see. So I studied Giardia in a class in college, and Giardia actually has five nuclei, I think. It has a macronucleus and then it has four micronuclei. So their, their sex, the way they, they cross their DNA and share DNA is, is really complex because these macronuclei like degrade and then something happens with the micronuclei. I can't even remember it, but it involves conjugation. So sharing of DNA, swapping of DNA through a pillus of sorts. Um, and so sex, sexual reproduction just means the swapping of DNA between two organisms to create a genetically unique offspring. Okay, so my favorite type of eukaryotic pathogen are the helminths, the parasitic worms. And although a lot of the adult worms are macroscopic, you can see them with the naked eye, especially something like a tapeworm, which can be several feet long, um, the infective stage, the larval and the eggs are microscopic. So we still lump them in with microbes because the part that would that would get us sick, we can't see. So um, the three different types of helminths are the nematodes, which are the roundworms, the cestodes, which are the tapeworms, and the trematodes, which are the flukes. Tapeworms and flukes are both types of flatworms. And the term for flatworm is platyhelminth, literally means flatworm. So there's, I guess you could say there's two types of worms, roundworms and flatworms, and there's two types of flatworms, tapeworms and flukes. You should, I bolded these, you should know these different terms. You should be able to match platyhelminth with flatworm and cestode with tapeworm and stuff like that. So let's, oh, this is just another picture showing you 
some roundworm structures and some flatworm structures. All right, so helminths are all multicellular animals. They are the, you know, eggs are single celled and those are what usually infect us. Um, but the adults are multicellular animals with basic organ systems. Some of them are what we call sexually dimorphic, meaning the male and the female are different looking and have distinct different features. Um, the helminth that I actually studied in grad school is the one pictured here. It's called a schistosome. And it may at first look like one worm, but this is actually two worms. So here are the suckers of the male worm. This is the male's body. It has all these little bumps on it, all right? And this groove here in the center actually houses the female worm. This is the female's head sticking out, and this is the female's tail sticking out. So she's long and thin, and he's big and flat, and he basically wraps around her. I think of it as like a banana and a peel. She's like the banana flesh, and he's like the banana peel. And so they definitely look very different. They are sexually dimorphic. Um, some types of worms, like Ascaris, I think that we know, maybe Ascaris is dimorphic. Well, I can't, I can't give you an example, but, oh, tapeworms. Tapeworms are hermaphroditic. So they have both male parts and female parts. They have testes and ovaries. Um, and we'll see some examples. So helminths have really complicated life cycles. They have at least three stages to their life cycle. So at least an egg, a larva, and an adult stage. Some have many larval stages. So they can have these really complex um, life cycles. The other thing about helminths is they are, they're parasitic worms. They are all parasites, meaning they must live inside a host. Some of them have multi-host life cycles. So they might um, infect one animal and then that animal gets eaten and they infect that new animal. Um, some, a lot, very common form of, of transmission for helminths is the fecal oral route, basically meaning that, you know, one organism poops out the eggs and somebody else eats the eggs and gets infected. It might be um, animals of the same species, or it might be two different species. Um, there are some uh, helminths that infect through the skin, so transdermal infection. There are worms that have larvae that will literally burrow through your bare feet, the skin in your bare feet when you're walking in the soil, and then they basically swim through the body, through the blood, and end up in the intestines. Um, there are ones that are vector-borne, meaning they're transmitted by biting insects, and there are those that are um, transmitted through a predator prey, so they might infect a mouse, and then the mouse gets eaten by a cat, and now the cat is infected. So the definitive host is the one where the adult life stage is reached, where the, where the um, helminth becomes an adult worm. If there are two hosts, the one where it stays in the larval stage is the intermediate host. And we'll talk about tapeworms being a classic example of those having a two host life cycle where the cow and pig serve as the intermediate host and humans serve as the definitive host. So some different examples of helminths are on this table from the chapter. Um, we have intestinal nematodes. I'm going to show you the life cycle of Ascaris and of Enterobius, which is pinworm. You probably will never have Ascaris. You may have had pinworm or had kids that had pinworm. It's still a fairly common helminth infection in the U.S., but it's really the only one. There's there, Helminth infections are really very uncommon um, in developed countries, but they are incredibly common in undeveloped countries. Um, some others that you may have heard of, um, Oncocerca is the leading cause of preventable blindness um, in under, undeveloped countries. It, it is a vector-borne parasite, so you get it from fly bites, and the worm actually can localize to the eye, and, and it's said that people who are infected, sometimes you can actually see the worm crawl across the eye. It's like 
the size maybe of like a nail clipping. It's small, but it's visible. Dracunculus, the guinea worm. This one's fun. So this one, the adult lives under the skin and it forms like a blister with a little hole, a little opening, and it, it becomes very inflamed and hot and it burns. And so when you have like a swollen, burning part of your skin, you what do you want to do? You want to put it in water so that you can cool it off. So you go to the river and you stick your foot in the water and then the worm sticks its little butt out and starts laying its eggs in the water. And then those those little baby worms, the larva, can infect somebody else transdermally. Or sorry, if you ingest them, ingesting the water. So it's, you know, there are these crazy, crazy different life cycles. Um, schistosomes, I'm going to walk you through the life cycle of those. And tania, tapeworms, I'll walk you through the life cycle of those. So the first one, um, and if you have eaten recently, you may want to, you know, watch this later or maybe not eat right after watching this. I don't know. That's what my students usually tell me. They lose their appetite when I talk about helminths, but I just think they're super cool. So pinworm, pinworm, you may have had this infection as an adult or more likely as a kid, or you may have had kids that had this infection. Um, so pinworms are pretty common in the environment. You can, the eggs um, are in soil, in sandboxes, and little kids play outside and they don't wash their hands. They put their hands in their mouth, and they eat dirt, whatever. And so these eggs, they can end up ingesting these eggs, which hatch in their intestines into larvae, which then mature into adult worms. Now the adult females at night, they will crawl down um, the out of the large intestine. So the, the larvae develop in the small intestine. The adults live in the large intestine. And I don't know what they, I guess they must eat bacteria in the large intestine. So they really don't make you sick. You don't have any symptoms. Um, but what they do at night, the female comes out, she crawls down to the opening of the anus, and she lays her eggs there and she uses her saliva to stick the eggs outside like on the opening of the anus all right and that saliva dries up and then your butt is itchy like kind of like if you don't wipe well if you have something dried on your butt it itches and so then you scratch your butt and you get these eggs under your hand under your nails which you can eat or you can touch things and get them on toys and then that kid touches the toy and they put it in their mouth so that's how it spreads um, and the only real symptom is an itchy butt <clears throat> and so there is something called a tape test that you can do if you have uh, like an infant or a toddler that you suspect might have pinworm um, and you can put a piece of tape on their butt like before they go to bed and then in the morning you take it off and you see if you a you might have trapped some adult worms but b you see if there's any there's any eggs there um, you can look at it under a microscope to look for the eggs you can also just go in at night with a flashlight and sometimes you can catch these adult worms coming out of the anus they're small they're really small but they're still disturbing to capture um, and you know it can be hard sometimes with kids because you know, kids scratch their butts a lot. They're not the best wipers. And my daughter, when she was potty training, I used to always say, I was always checking for, she would itch and I'd be like, do you have worms? Um, and, you know, she is a microbiologist for a mom, so she's used to that kind of stuff. But yeah, I was always, I was always concerned. It was usually just that she hadn't wiped well. Um, but it, it is something that can go around and like, preschools and but adults can get it too especially if you work with kids um, and it is treatable there's an anti helminthic that you take that essentially kills the worms or um, paralyzes them and you and, and you essentially poof them out and they're gone and you're good um, tapeworm tapeworm is another one that actually does still it it's still it's not terribly common in the US but it's also not like super rare. I don't know how many cases a year there are, but I would say I'm going to, no, I'm going to look it up. <clears throat> Let's see here. 
How many cases of tapeworm in the US? Probably didn't phrase that well. Mm -hmm, Siri, you are not as helpful as I wish you were. Liz Taniasis. Okay. The number of new cases in the US each year is probably less than a thousand, but an exact number is not known. Okay, so it happens. If it's less than a thousand, that means it's probably more than 500. Um, all right, so how do you get tapeworm? A lot of people know you get tapeworm from eating undercooked meat, specifically undercooked beef or pork. So this is how it happens. Um, someone who's infected or an animal who's infected poops out these proglottids. So the tapeworm, adult tapeworms, each of their body segments actually contains a reproductive unit contains these they are hermaphroditic so they have testes and ovaries within each of these these segments and they fertilize and form eggs and when the eggs are mature that segment sort of falls off so this segment this proglottid is actually full of thousands of these little eggs and so they are passed in the stool and the stool can you know find its way into soil or plants or animal feed and the animals eat it the animals become infected and when the when the eggs hatch in the animals the larvae travel to the muscle tissue and form these cysts in the muscles and so sometimes the animals might get sick they might have like muscular issues if they are really full chock full of these these tapeworm cysts but a lot of times they don't appear sick, so you don't know that they're infected. Um, you slaughter the animal, and the cysts are small, um, but you can find them on examination. So I do think that food safety, like part of food safety standards are you have to check the meat. They have to check the meat for these cysts. But the other thing is, if you freeze the meat, the freezing process, when you freeze the cyst, you kill it. They're, um, susceptible like the ice crystals form and break their little tissues and stuff so any frozen meat is you should be safe from tapeworm but fresh meat if not so the other thing that can kill the cysts is heat right so cooking it properly so freezing your meat first or cooking it properly are ways to kill these cysts but if you eat fresh meat that is undercooked or raw all right, that is when you can become infected with tapeworm. So you, you consume the cyst, it hatches in the small intestine, and then it grows in the small intestine, very large, up to like, I don't know, I think they can be like six feet long tapeworms. And then you start pooping out the proglottids and you can continue, you know, the life cycle can continue. One of the biggest dangers of a tapeworm infection, so tapeworm infection, it can sometimes um, lead to like cramping of the gut because the the head really they have these like um, little spiky mouths these suckers that grab onto the wall of the intestine so it can lead to intestinal bleeding and cramping um, these guys can absorb quite a lot of nutrients so you can end up malnourished because they basically steal your new nu your nutrition and in a lot of developing companies companies countries um, worm infections are actually a major cause of malnutrition. They have um, poor, poor food supply and food security, but they also have these worms in their bellies that are sucking up any nutrients that they do manage to consume. Um, and tapeworms can live for years, possibly even decades in the body. And so, yes, they can rob you of nutrients, but the the bigger danger is if you accidentally consume these eggs, these proglottids, because what happens is they, the cyst or the larva hatches out and is like thinking it's in a pig or a cow. So it goes to look for muscle tissue to form a cyst in, and it can form cysts in your muscles and disrupt your muscles. But because you aren't a pig or a cow, these cysts, these little larvae often get lost and they tend to end up instead in the brain. And this here is a brain scan of someone who has what's called neurosister sarcosis, or basically 
tapeworm cysts in the brain. Um, that's what all of these dark spots are. That's not normal. And these are untreatable at this point. You can't treat, you can treat a tapeworm infection of the intestine. You can take an anti-helminthic that kills the tapeworm and then you essentially poop it out. Um, these cysts won't hatch, but they also won't go away. You can't clear them. Um, and surgery is usually not recommended because that can be more dangerous. So they can disrupt brain function. I mean, they can cause symptoms of, you know, cognitive issues or motor issues, depending on where in the brain they form, kind of like a, like a non-cancerous tumor. Um, so yeah, there's actually, there was a trend for a while, I don't remember what the years were, where people would, would consume tapeworm, tapeworm eggs, um, or they would consume, I guess, the cysts, whatever, they would purposely infect themselves with tapeworms as like a dieting mechanism because sometimes you do lose weight and they are stealing your nutrients. Um, but the downside is you're really at risk for much more serious disease. And also they can do some serious damage to your intestines depending. So I definitely don't recommend trying to give yourself a tapeworm on purpose. Schistosomes. These do not exist in the U.S. You do not have to worry about um, getting infected while swimming in your favorite ocean or lake stateside. These are um, worms, parasitic worms, that have an intermediate host of a snail, and they're very specific about the snail host, and these snails only live in really tropical regions, so that's why there aren't any in North America. There are some in South America, parts of the Middle East, and Africa, and Southeast Asia, so those are the areas where schistosomiasis can occur. So this, ha this helminth just has a, a wonky life cycle that I like to go through. So people who are infected poop out eggs, the eggs make their way into the water system through, you know, sewage contamination. And the eggs hatch. And the first larval stage is called a mericidia. You don't have to know all these different names of the stages. Um, and it's like this little, it's like a little ciliated paramecium kind of. And it swims and it infects the snail of choice, depending on the species of worm. Each species of worm infects a specific species of snail. It grows into the next larval stage inside the snail and then hatches out of that larval stage as these cercaria, which look kind of like sperm with mermaid tails, with forked tails. And these little cercaria, spermy things, swim through the water and find a person, skin, and they literally burrow through the skin. Um, and sometimes when they do that, I mean, they're, they're like the size of sperm. They're small. You can't see them. Actually, they're a little bigger than sperm. And they, but you still can't see them in the water. And they burrow through the skin. And um, they sometimes leave a little bit of a rash. In fact, if you've ever been swimming, like even locally in the Adirondacks, sometimes people walk away from the lakes with something that they call duck itch because there are bird specific species of schistosomes that infect like geese and so and the geese poop around here all the time so their their cercaria can be in the water here we have snails in a lot of the lakes and um and they can burrow through the skin but then they die they don't cause infection but they do cause a little inflammation of the skin but a lot of times when these cercaria especially if they're um you know a human specific kind they don't necessarily leave a skin rash and you have no idea you've been infected. So they burrow through the skin, they find their way to the circulatory system, to a blood vessel, and they travel through the circulatory system first to the lungs, the um, circulature around the lungs. And, um, and then they actually go to the intestines next and they live in the vasculature around the intestines and the male and the adults mature there and they live specifically in the vasculature that leads from the intestines to the liver the portal the portal vasculature and they that's the best place really 
in the blood for a whole month to choose because that's where all the nutrients like if you eat food and you absorb all the nutrients all like that's like the most delicious blood in the body right there it's got all the nutrients from your from your food so they just live there and they actually eat blood cells and they lay lots and lots of eggs and then the female is somehow manages to push the eggs through the wall of the intestine and the eggs end up getting pooped out but not all of them about half the eggs probably managed to get pushed through the wall and get pooped out the other half end up getting swept up in the flow of blood and they lodge themselves in the liver and so the worms themselves don't really cause any symptoms it's the eggs once they start building up in the liver they start causing liver inflammation and liver problems and ultimately can lead to liver failure um, if you've had an infection for several years. So these guys can live for like decades inside of a host. Again, they are treatable. The thing about helminths is we don't build up natural immunity to them. So pretty much all helminth infections you can get again and again and again. So you can take drugs, you can take medicine to treat the infection, but you go swimming in that body of water again and you get reinfected. And that's a problem because a lot of the places where these helminths are problematic are in developing countries where, A, they may not have access to the medication. And if they do, great, they're treated once, but then they're exposed to these environments again and again and again. And so they just suffer these chronic infections and chronic reinfection. So the last one uh, that I'll talk about is Ascaris. And Ascaris is a nematode, a roundworm. And there are some infections in like rural parts of the U.S. sometimes still usually associated with pig farms, um, but really uncommon in the U.S., e even less common than tapeworm infections. Um, but again, in developing countries, it can be very common, particularly in children. And again, it comes from that oral fecal route. So uh, an infected person um, is shedding eggs in their feces and then if that feces gets into the water or gets onto produce or something or just they didn't wash their hands well and then eat food all right those eggs end up in their mouth they swallow them into the intestines the eggs hatch in the intestines and then the worms go into the circulatory system find their way to the lungs and then they do some maturing in the lungs for a couple of weeks and then they burrow through the alveoli into the airway where you cough them up essentially and then swallow them like it's I don't know how they came to this life cycle it's crazy right like it's just very roundabout but that's what happens you sort of cough them up and then swallow them down your throat and now they go into the intestines for a second time and now they're ready to mature into adults Okay, so these adult Ascaris worms are fairly large, as you can see in this picture, and you can have multiple, you can get a really heavy burden of infection. Um, the Ascaris worms themselves don't usually cause many symptoms. They can lead to malnutrition, especially if you have a heavy burden. Um, a heavy burden of infection can also lead to bowel obstructions, which probably might have occurred with this person here. Um, they can be treated. The treatment, again, with for a lot of these helminths, the medicine doesn't actually kill the worms. It just kind of paralyzes them. So they let go because they all kind of hold on. They have suckers or mouth parts that allow them to hold on and attach to the intestinal wall. And then when you take the drug, they can't hold on anymore. And so you end up just pooping them out. It's not pretty, but it clears the infection. Um, so, yeah. That's all I was going to say about Ascaris. So all of these helminths you may have never heard of before and certainly probably have never had. And that's because they're pretty not, you know, existent in the developed U.S. Um, they are much higher incidence in tropical regions and in particular a lot of tropical regions, a lot of countries in tropical regions are also developing countries. And so while you may not experience them here in the U.S. and Canada, um, there are billions of cases occurring every year worldwide in these tropical regions.
Um, so the red shows areas where um, these soil transmitted helminth infections are a real public health problem. And in pink are areas where there are storm cell, the soil transmitted helminth infections, but they're not as much of a problem. So you can see in the southern US, it's still a reality. And in Australia and in parts of Europe, okay, but these are all developed nations, so they have better control of them versus the undeveloped nations where it's a much bigger a much bigger health problem. And this is a dated picture, by the way. This is 2006, so I should update that, but it just kind of it highlights these tropical areas where you can find abundant um, helminth infections. So helminth infections are <clears throat> classified, um, microbiologists have a group of diseases that they call neglected tropical diseases. And they're neglected in terms of research in terms of funding, in terms of control. So these are um, microbes that cause millions of cases of disease every year, but are just not getting attention and, and funding for research because A, um, a lot of them are not terribly, you know, deadly. They tend to cause chronic issues, long-term chronic issues like malnutrition and stunted growth, um, but they're not like horrific and scary and deadly. And that's usually what people will throw money, money at. Um, they also tend to affect people in undeveloped countries. And again, we tend to throw money at diseases that affect, you know, the rich nations that have a lot of money are going to spend that money to study diseases that affect them and not other parts of the world that don't affect them. So these are, there's a, you know, a whole slew of scientists and researchers that are passionate about these pathogens and created like, oh, there's a whole um, journal that's dedicated to research in neglected tropical diseases. So these are the grizzly seven neglected tropical diseases, um, six of which are parasitic worms are helminths. So here's Ascaris, the one I just showed you, somebody pooping them out. There's whipworm, there's hookworm, schistosomiasis is another big one, lymphatic filariasis, this one is insect transmitted, and onchocercosis, onchos, onchocerciasis, onchocerciasis is the name of the worm. And this is the one that causes river blindness, infect the eyes, so, um, and then this last one, trachoma, is actually a type of bacteria. And so that is the end. That's all I have to say about that. Um, have a good lunch.